Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's one minute past 10, so I think uh, it's time to get started. Uh, welcome to our event in partnership with Understanding Society, which is focused on the role of geographical mobility and commuting in tackling uh, spatial disparities. In a moment, we're going to hear from our, our brilliant panel of speakers. Uh, as always, the event is being recorded and will be made available on our website after the event, along with all the slides that you're about to see from our speakers. During the event, if you're new to Zoom, where there can't be many of you now, uh, we encourage you to select Speaker View. That's the best experience to watch it on. And if you can keep your microphones on mute, unless you're asking a question, uh, that will be much appreciated. And the hashtag for the event is CFC Mobility. Um, after our four uh, speakers have made their presentations, which will be around uh, 50 to 60 minutes, we'll have about 30 minutes for, for questions and answers. You can submit a question uh, you don't have to wait until the end. You can submit it uh, during the presentations via the chat function to ask a question. There is a channel if you go into the uh, the chat function, ask a question. If you ping that uh, that uh, the question to us, we'll have a look. And then when we get to them, uh, we'll be asking you to ask your question. It's not me asking your question. It's you asking your question. So be prepared um, for that as well. And we will be done um, by uh, 11.30. So let's move on to the, the contributions. Before we get into the detail, I'm going to ask Raj Patel, who's the Associate Director of Policy at Understanding Society, so just to say a little bit more about what Understanding Society is and why it's such a rich source of insight, uh, intelligence, and data. Raj, over to you. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, of course, we're delighted um, you've been able to join us um, for this um, um, important event on geographical mobility um, um, and access to transport uh, that we're doing with the Center for Cities. Um, the presentations this morning ultimately will use a range of data sources, um, one of them being understanding society. Um, <clears throat> and so I thought I'd say a few words for those people who are particularly new uh, to the study itself. Um, it's a longitudinal panel study of individuals and household. And what that means is essentially, we track the same individuals annually to try and understand the causes and consequences uh, of macro changes or micro changes, both in the short term, of course, and more importantly, over the long term. Um, the study was started in 2009. Uh, and it builds on something that's been running for a long time called the British Household Panel Study that was started in 1991. So it offers us a good um, number of years of continuous data um, over, of over 30 years, roughly. Uh, we survey all adults uh, aged 16 and over, and children aged 10 to 15 receive their own youth survey as well. Um, and the study focuses on a number of broad areas of people's lives, uh, particularly. Uh, so those are um, education, um, employment, income, consumption, deprivation, ex expenditure, all to do with household finances and, and living standards, for instance, um, health and well-being, um, families and family life, and a sixth category, which we call civics, but broadly includes things such as political participation, leisure participation, environmental attitudes and behaviors, etc. Um, all the data is geocoded at various levels of geography, which means one can do all sorts of interesting spatial analysis, um, as well as temporal analysis um, about places. Uh, and although the sample is only representative of the regions themselves, uh, including Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, but not necessarily representative of individual local authorities. Um, so I think that's all I'll say initially about the study. And certainly, if people have any questions separately from the substantive topic, which I'm sure all of you are very interested in, which is about geographical mobility, uh, then I'll, I'll pick up those in the Q&A session. Thanks, Sandra. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Raj. And uh, we'll put more details about understanding society, what it is, and how you can uh, get hold of some of the data and some of the insights on our website after the event. So there'll be a re kind of real resource pack there for people who are interested, uh, both in the subject matters, but also understanding society more uh, generally. Let's move to our 
speaker and our first speaker is Dr. Ian Butterworth. Ian is based in the School of Natural and Built Environment at Queen's University Belfast and he's going to focus on whether people in the UK are moving less or more and take a long-term perspective. Ian, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, I hope you can all see the screen and good morning to everybody who's attending the meeting. Um, uh, the talk I'm going to give today will is based on work that I've undertaken with Tom Cook and with Tony Champion. So it's mainly work that's been done with them. And the title is about England and Wales, but I do look more broadly to Scotland and to Northern Ireland as well, to try to give a whole UK context. So I'm thinking in those terms, but I'm also setting the patterns that we've observed in the UK in a wider context of what we've seen in other countries in Europe and North America, and indeed in other parts of the world. And the focus in terms of the geographical mobility is on internal migration. Now this is defined, or the way we've conceptualized it, is in terms of an address change. So it's about how often people have changed address, the distances over which they've moved, and the trends in how they've changed address through time. So what I've done to try to um, structure the talk is to try to respond to some of the questions that were outlined in the brief for the session. So the ones I felt I could best address, and I've not actually considered COVID because I think actually um, we've got not enough data yet to consider that, but the questions that um, I wanted to address are the current trends, say something a little bit about who, when and how far people move, and say something else as well about whether longer term trends are overriding cyclical factors. In essence, short term factors such as cycles in mobility and migration associated with a business cycle still exist. But in the UK, they're overlain on what appears to be a long-term decline in address changing. So that's the first sort of point to make. And I'll expand upon these points, particularly the trend issue, which is really what I want to focus on in this slide later on, and also on other slides further on in the presentation. The second overall point to make is that when people change address, most people move relatively short distances there's a pretty severe quick distance cutoff. Of course, some people move over 100 kilometers or move between regions, but I've got some evidence on the trends and the distribution of moves in Appendix 1 towards the end of this presentation, which you'll be able to see to look at some of the distribution of the types of moves. Now, migration as well, address changing, is structured mainly by age, housing, tenure, and education. Plus region as well, and I think there's some interesting things where there are some regions where there seems to be lower rates of address changing. And here I'm thinking perhaps of regions like the Northeast. The final point to note, and a lot of the work we've done is based on census longitudinal studies, which measures migration events rather than transitions between place one and place two, is that some people do still move very frequently. They might move four, five, six, seven, or eight times in a decade. But this isn't necessarily something that is positive, and it's not necessarily something which is a sign of social advantage. There's a great deal of short distance mobility, in particular, and highly mobile people, and it's often associated with poor health and poor labour market outcomes and poor educational qualifications. But let's move on to the trends. So it's fairly well established empirically that internal migration has slowed in the UK. I'm thinking here really over the period of the last um, 50 years. So in England and Wales, you see there that 55% of people changed address at least once between 71 and 81. Between 2001 and 2011, it was only 2.5%. 
45%. Now that trend might have been reversed when we get the 2021 census data in. And that's going to be a moot point. But there's been evidence of a fairly long-term decline in address changing. And in England and Wales, it's mainly distances, moves over distances of less than 10 kilometres. So it's short distance moves that have tended to um, decrease, moves over short distances, which have decreased most markedly and most obviously. In Northern Ireland since 1981, there's evidence that moves between SOAs have decreased. So less mobility there. And in Scotland, the work that, Dr. that David McCollum has done on uh, using the Scottish longitudinal study has suggested there's been a decrease in address changing over various um, spatial distances there. Now, the interesting question is, is this something just to do with the UK or isn't it? Is it just something to do with our country, with our labour market, to do with our housing market or whatever? Well, the answer is, is no. It's part of a broader global pattern. So in the United States, there's been a fall in mobility across um, all distances, quite large and longer distances since 1980. Ditto Australia, ditto for Canada. And in Iceland, which is an interesting case study, there's obviously strong business cycles there, but the long-term trend from 1986 is for house moving address changes to fall into regionally, particularly in moves from the regions to the capital. Now in Europe, the picture is more mixed. So in Europe, um, some countries like Sweden have seen slightly increased address changing over the same time period. But in general, most countries have stayed the same and quite a few have become less mobile. So it does raise questions as to whether this is something fundamentally different about the way society operates now, and the way it operated in the past. Just as a quick aside, there is a bit of a housing, there is an address changing gradient, an internal migration gradient within Europe. So countries in the south and the east tend to have lower rates of internal migration. The Nordic countries tend to have higher rates of address changing and um, internal migration. And in Western Europe, where we fall, we're somewhere in the middle. So we're sort of a middle tier country. So we're not as mobile as somewhere like Sweden, but we're quite a lot, mobile, a lot more mobile than somewhere like Poland internally or in somewhere like Spain. Now the factors that are cited, which are general and across a lot of advanced countries where we've seen this decrease is population aging. So we know that older people don't move as much, so as population ages, there's something going on there with population compositions moving towards less mobile groups. Another thing that's been identified and suggested as a cause which we need more research on is delayed life transitions, especially younger people leaving home and they're leaving home later. So there's less, it takes out a lot of housing mobility for the most mobile age groups of the population and it maybe defers mobility to later on it also gives a shorter time for people to make multiple moves in. But the differences in the degree and the type of fall between countries indicates nationally specific factors and reasons are probably also important. And in England and Wales, it tends to be that most short distance moves are associated with housing, housing requirement, housing needs, environment and neighbourhood. So it's possible here, one would suggest here that perhaps there's um, something happening in the housing market. And there's just some hypotheses and some suggested sort of pauses that are mentioned there, possible causes. So owners, for example, sitting on an appreciating asset and people delaying departure from family size housing in older years because of better health. There could be things like that going on. But in the United States and other countries with things happening across all distance bands, it's too well to do with economic and structural factors. Now we've tried to model to try to explain these factors actually in England and Wales. We can explain between about a third and a half of the decrease between 71 and 81 and 2001 and 11 by changes in age structure and in housing tenure. But it does leave a lot still unexplained here and elsewhere. So one other answer could be 
culture. People prefer to remain stationary. They prefer to remain settled. This so-called secular rootedness that Tom Cook has suggested. Maybe there's been the substitution of housing moves by other types of mobility, e.g. commuting on a daily or weekly basis. We mentioned the delayed life transitions, but there could also be, maybe for some people, IT has maybe substituted for housing moves, has made it possible for people to stay put where they are if they're content, but work remotely and use IT. There's actually quite a lot of debate about the effects of IT on internal migration and on, on, on address changes. There's those who say it might actually increase mobility and internal migration, and there's those who don't. But there's quite a lot of evidence that it may actually have to decrease spatial mobility. The implications of this are something I just like to sort of consider. Now, the effects, the decrease in migration, internal migration, are statistically significant interregionally because of the size of our data, but they're actually quite small substantively, right? If you've seen the point that I'm making. But there could be an issue potentially about labour match, mismatch, supply and demand of labour. But I think the main issue if people are immobile and the distances are at fairly small spatial scales, they could still be important in labour market terms. And the reason for that is that um, quite a lot of people have got short commutes for some demographic groups. So some people don't move very far in their daily commute anyway. So if people aren't moving even short distances, it may mean that there could be mismatches, perhaps at sub-regional or at city scales, perhaps. And there's a question of whether we should bring investment people, e.g. jobs for people, or whether we can try to get people either to commute longer distances if needed to get to work, or whether there should be some attempts to get short distance mobility up. So it's like me, for example, living in Belfast. Um, if I can't change address or I don't want to change address, I've either got to commute a long distance to a job, or else I don't get the job, even if it's in the same city region. So there's questions perhaps there about sort of the spatial scale over which this might work out. And I'm not sure about it. I think there's evidence as well, I and mean, this is something about the social effects, but I put them blue positive and red negative. Now, whether they're negative or positive, it's uh, really it's sort of uh, take your pick, really, and uh, pay your money and take your choice. But that's sort of my take on them. So if people aren't moving as much, one positive effect might be more stable communities. It might be greater community social capital. It might be greater sense of community and safety, perhaps. On the other hand, if people aren't moving even over short distances, it suggests that there could be less social mobility via the housing market, less scope of people to move from poorer areas to better off areas, less chance for people to get around urban areas even. It could lead to market failure to allocate housing. So this is the case where, for example, um, people aren't moving out of housing, which may be something they don't longer require to be in. If you think about, say, me, the children have moved out, but I'm not going to move, and I've got my house here, and I may be sort of basically blocking the housing market. So that could be viewed as being negative as well. And we don't know why people are actually staying put. If people are happy, this may be a good thing, but are there people out there who actually want to move but can't move? Are they frustrated stayers? Are they unhappy? So overall, I think there's questions about the entrenchment of spatial privilege and deprivation, perhaps, with the decrease in address changing and internal migration. Now, something which I'm not sure whether it's good or bad, and I've done it in red and blue, is it could mean more commuting for some who do have to move around more because they can't change address. So if they change jobs, they're more likely to commute further. So that could in, incur environmental costs, but you could view it as being something which is positive in terms of just general social mixing and getting people about. 
I'm not quite sure how to view that. <coughs> but the final thing, which is um, the sting in the tail, is that I've been doing some work recently looking at um, how migration and address changing relates to things like voting for Brexit or attitudes towards immigrants. And basically, <coughs> people who don't move seem to be more insular. They seem to be less trusting. They seem to have more of a closed attitude, politically and socially, attitudinally. So there's maybe interesting things there that could be teased out. So in terms of people not moving much, one of the costs of it could be that it's actually enshrining and fixing people in places where they're isolated, where indeed they're left behind, not only in terms of place, if we accept that sort of debate and argument, but also in terms of um, their own personal mobility as well. And there's some evidence that people who don't move tend to be less open and less trusting. That the experience of moving over certain distances tends to lead to more positive attitudes and a more cosmopolitan attitude, particularly towards outgroups, if we think that's a desirable thing. So I think that's actually finished um, what I wanted to say in terms of the presentation. Um, I've actually got some material here. This is based on some of the work that I did with Tony Champion, which is looking at um, uh, declining migration in the United States. And you can see what's going on there. And with Tony as well, which is showing some of the picture there about what's happened in England and Wales, which was substantiating the first point that I made. And it does show this big decrease in moves over 10 kilometers, in moves under 10 kilometers. And this is some work that I was actually doing in Iceland on tolerance and attitudes towards immigrants as well. So I've actually got interest in that sort of area following um, uh, the work I did earlier on decreasing internal migration. So um, that's me. Thank, thank you very much. I hope I've kept to time. Fantastic. <laughs> screen sharing. That's perfect. Thank you very much. If you can just stop screen, uh, sharing your I screen. I am. And I'm that muting. Was, that was perfect. Thank you very much indeed. And already raised a number of issues I know, uh, you know in terms of the research, but also uh, the policy implications that you were just alluding to towards the end, which I think are, should provide a, a fascinating conversation. So um, let's move on to our uh, second uh, speaker. That's Dr. Michael Thomas. Uh, Michael works in the Research Department at Statistics Norway. Uh, he's going to focus on some of the factors that influence why people move over those longer distances. So Michael, over to you. Yeah, thank you and uh, morning to everyone. Uh, just try and share the screen. Is that okay? There we go. That's perfect. If you've got on full screen now, that's perfect. Yeah, so um, a slightly uh, different angle from what Ian was presenting on sort of the mobility trends. Here I'll be talking about. Um, why people, at least those who still are moving long distances, why they do move long distances in the UK. And uh, the presentation, I'll basically briefly outline some of our normative uh, ideas of, of the drivers of migration, uh, and then look at um, how when we ask the migrants themselves, um, how variations in motives exist, and, and if there are differences in economic outcomes associated with these different motives as well. So internal migration is generally regarded as a, as a positive process motivated by labor market considerations. So work and education, and we can trace this back at least to the work in the 1960s and 70s by economists such as Sharstad and the human capital models. Uh, and we generally consider at the macro level migration to be an important or necessary mechanism for um, labor market flexibility and efficiencies. I think Ian was mentioning just before some of these so the efficient allocating of allocation of individuals to different labor markets within the country. And at the micro level as well, we know that um, we assume at least that migration generally leads to favorable economic outcomes. And spatial mobility is often associated, uh, uh, social mobility is often linked to spatial mobility. And sometimes uh, 
place-based policies seek to integrate some form of spatial mobility when they're trying to uh, generate a degree of social mobility. But whether there's support for uh, this sort of idea of the positive outcomes is, is a little unclear. So there, there is some support. We know that wage growth premium exists for migration. This is especially amongst men. There's other research from the family migration literature showing that uh, married women in particular can can uh, suffer from migration, at least in the short term. These declines in, in economic outcomes for uh, married women tend to be quite short lived, but they still exist. Um, we know that large cities tend to yield high, higher rewards to human capital than rural areas and that highly educated tend to migrate much more than than uh, the less educated. So fitting with our classical human capital models. But we also know that um, when we just observe the aggregate flows that the patterns don't always fit so closely with our uh, assumptions. So in the UK, the dominant uh, migration flows have for many decades now been from urban areas out to suburban rural peripheries. So the urban rural shift and, and counter urbanization processes, that's when we look at all migrants together, not just focus on the small subset. There's also in the US context, little evidence for disproportionate flows of migrants towards um, high income locations. And uh, in the US, at least since the 1970s, um, the positive relationship between um, uh, regional income and population growth has, has gone negative um, and has failed to return to significant sort of uh, positive levels ever since. And there's some recent research as well, looking at how um, growing affordability crises in places of high productivity and wages work to discourage the movement of candidate workers. So some of the efficiencies we often assume uh, exist in, in, in migration, whether, they're, whether they ever existed or they're declining, as, as uh, some of the factors Ian was talking about come to the fore then. But these are important things to consider, at least. And what I wanted to do was, uh, these aggregate studies are very nice and, and informative, but it thought it might be useful to see what the migrants say themselves in terms of um, why they're moving. And there are uh, sort of a handful of previous studies that have looked at this, uh, primarily in the Western context. Um, we've got studies from Australia, the UK, New Zealand, Sweden, and the US that all are consistent in finding employment-related migration to be in the minority. So non-economic, primarily non-economic uh, motives make up the majority of, of people undertaking longer distance moves. And this is a plot, um, so this is using understanding society data um, and it shows the variations in, in the motives over distance. Um, this Northern Ireland wasn't included in this, so it's just for uh, Britain. And you can see along the bottom is distance, so from 20 kilometres up to 120 kilometres. The y-axis is showing the propensity uh, to mention a given motive. So if we look at the housing here, for instance, if we look at the 20 kilometres, then that's a, uh, just over 45% of migrants at 20 kilometers would mention housing as a primary motive for moving. And this fits with, again, what Ian was just mentioning. So these short distance moves typically associated with, with housing changes, preferences about housing changes, changes in housing consumption. Also, we tend to assume short distance moves are associated with family transitions, um, which themselves lead to housing consumption changes. So looking at this, we indeed see that housing declines with distance and fitting with our classical uh, assumptions, we see that education increases with distance. And you can see em uh, employment motives also become more important as we move up the distance continuum. But something that I found quite surprising when doing this was the persistent relevance of family as a, as a uh, driver of moves across the entire distance continuum. So not just short distance moves as we associate family with, but also longer distance moves up to 100 and, and even more than 100 kilometers. So then I wanted to consider what's the composition of these different migrants and uh, the reference for the paper there is just below. And to do this, we used uh, seven ways of understanding society data. Uh, applied for access to detailed geocodes so that we could look at more detailed distances rather than just looking at transitions between um, municipal boundaries, for instance. And uh, fortunately, due to the size of the survey, I was able to pull these waves and get a sample of 
223,000. And then within this, I got a subsample of migrants to look at variations within the group of migrants themselves as well, and collect a range of life course characteristics and conditions, um, including measures at the origin and destination in terms of uh, their relative location on the urban hierarchy, so from less rural areas through to the most urban core regions. And then migration here is defined as 40 kilometers or more. So we're looking at uh, longer distance moves. Those we traditionally associate with economic and educational factors. So uh, who moves for employment then? Uh, we see that 30% of all moves over 40 kilometers were associated with employment, primarily linked to employment. Uh, these two are the top two most cited submotives. So, in the sense, society is nice in that it offers us the opportunity to look at more specific submotives therein. And you can see that um, the majority moved to start a new job with a new employer. There's quite a small share, which is the second most common mo submotive, that change, uh, um, change, move, move to a new region but with uh, the same employer, so within company moves. And we can see that, as we would expect to think from our classical models, that this is largely restricted to migrants in early adulthood. It's associated with those who are highly qualified, private renters, so spatially flexible, and those moving up the urban hierarchy, so from less to more productive uh, regions. And these are really the group that we tend to consider in policy, I think, and, and focus a lot of our attention. Education comes in as the second most cited motive that's 26% of all migrations over 40 kilometers. And these, again, these submotives are your classic moving to and from educational institutions, as we would expect. This group, again, as we might expect, is even more exclusive. So it's particularly young adults operating outside of the labor market with post school, pre university qualifications. So your classic student migrants. And again, they've received quite a lot of attention in terms of migration into university and migration into the labor market following university. But a quarter of all those moves over 40 kilometers are made up of uh, family, people who are citing family as the primary motive for moving. So uh, when we look at the sub motives, the majority of those are, are noting a desire to be living closer to family and friends. And we know that proximity to family can bring all sorts of non-economic benefits in terms of um, better quality contact support and uh, care exchange. And when we look at the characteristics, we see this classic positive relationship between human capital and migration is weaker. And the migrants citing family related motives are from typically from more established populations. So those associated with family forming mid and later life phases. But I think it's interesting as well to know that these are people who tend to have fewer resources and those with particular care needs. So for instance, uh, support needs related to having uh, young children in the, in the home. And these are the people who are more likely to seek proximity to family. So having looked at that uh, with colleagues, um, Brian Gillespie and Clara Mulder at the University of Groningen, we start to look at um, how variations in economic outcomes are associated with variations in, in the motives that they give for moving. And this is uh, from a Swedish survey which looks specifically at migrants and their economic outcomes. Um, and it's linked to the Swedish population register data. And we find, as we might expect, that primarily family-driven migrants tend to are more likely to experience deteriorations in, in labor market outcomes. Uh, we have a, a range of nice measures here, because we have salary, uh, we can look at work opportunities, and, and we can also ask the migrants about um, whether they consider themselves to be engaged in more interesting work tasks at the destination as compared to the origin. There might, even here, there might, it might be interesting to note that there could be a selection here in, in, among family migrants that means that they're already more likely to value non-economic motives than economic motives. Perhaps this is a select group of people. And, and so in analyses that don't take this into consideration, there could be biases that result from that if we just treat all migrants as the, as the same. Um, but this is a particularly interesting finding, and I think maybe in the context of COVID as well. We found that among the unemployed, so if we're expecting a large bump in unemployment, among the unemployed, those who migrate for family have a higher likelihood of transitioning into employment than those who migrated for non-family related reasons. And the question is whether, I guess, family act as a source of information for finding and securing employment um, and whether family can help to mitigate barriers to employment that would otherwise uh, exist.
there's some study from other countries in Italy, for instance, where the family employment, small businesses is particularly important, but maybe that's the context, the case in other countries as well. So just to wrap up uh, quickly, uh, the drivers of migration seem to be more nuanced than we often think, and family is just as important as employment and education, even at the longer distances. These migrants that we tend to not focus so much on and form our policies around it, typically mid late life phases, low, lower levels of education with uh, resident children um, as well. And their labor markets are also importantly different. So there's the negatives that I mentioned, but also interesting that they're associated with uh, improved um, chances of transitioning into employment among the unemployed. And of course, there are all those other benefits that I, didn't, that I mentioned very briefly, those non-economic benefits associated to care provision and sports exchange that are important for individuals, but also governments. Because if we consider the future contexts, COVID, of course, might be relevant here as well, but in terms of things that we know for sure are also happening, population aging is going to be a very important thing to consider. Uh, we have the welfare state retrenchment, not just in the UK, but in many Western contexts. And we also know that there's a rising uh, interest and a rising importance as well of family in systems of social care. So whether in the future we see family becoming an even more important driver of, of migration, also possibly an even more important driver of immobility uh, in the context of what Ian was talking about. And I think this deserves uh, quite a lot more attention than we currently give it. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, um, Michael. F again, fascinating uh, insight into different um, aspects. It'd be interesting when we get to the Q and A just to get your reflect or your thoughts on whether you've you've looked at or if there is any differences between people that are moving for the first time or for the second time or indeed for the third time and whether their motivations, you know, vary over time. And for both of you, which again, not for now, but when we get into the conversation, interesting if we've got any sense as to you know these are the revealed preferences in some respects of the people that have actually moved do we have any sense as to the you know to the residual you know would want to move if uh, but feel that they can't for whatever you know for whatever um reason but we can get into that when we get to the um to the q a don't forget you can continue to submit your uh, your questions you don't have to wait until the end we've had some good ones in uh, so by all means uh, keep keep doing them via the chat function to ask a, a question but let's move to our our third speaker, which is Kieran Chatterjee. Kieran is an associate professor at the University of the West of England uh, and is going to focus a little bit now around the questions and issues in relation to transport and how that begins to affect commuting decisions that are made. Kieran, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I want to shine a light on the role of transport and daily travel for helping people in different geographical settings to get on well in life. And I think it complements uh, Ian and Michael's um, presentations. I will start um, with findings from a study conducted for the Department for Transport um, last year using understanding society data to find out how access to transport affects life opportunities. And given the importance of employment um, to people's long-term health and well-being, I also then take a look at commuting trends pre-COVID-19. And I think they're actually instructive um, for the post-COVID-19 situation. And I'll finish by trying to um, tie transport into the previous presentations. So starting with the um, Department for Transport study, which was published in October last year, transport is one of many factors, not perhaps the most obvious one we might think of as affecting um, people's life opportunities, as we might tend to think that everyone has some form of transport available to them. But if we look at, say, for example, in employment, um, previous findings highlight the um, importance of transport. There's a 2011 Centre for Cities report, um, Access All Areas Linking People to Jobs, um, which showed a spatial mismatch between um, where low-skilled workers um, live and where jobs are located. And then in 2018, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation funded a report tackling transport-related barriers to employment in low-income neighbourhoods, found employment opportunities difficult to reach by public transport, and as a consequence, out-of-work residents in the areas that they looked at were unwilling to um, go very far to look for jobs, especially if they 
if, if those jobs were insecure. So the Department of Transport commissioned um, NATSEN and my, my university, UWE, to use the opportunity presented from the longitudinal data, particularly of understanding society, to seek a robust assessment of um, how the role of transport for life opportunities and well-being across the um, English population and to build on findings from previous work which tended to con concentrate on um, specific places and groups and to look at this across the, the, the wider population. And it was, it was England only as we needed to do some data linking which wasn't possible with, with the other nations. The, the conceptual basis for the study which I hope is quite intuitive, but still helpful to, to, to illustrate in this, the way it's shown here, is that people's ability to access activities, education, jobs, networks, services, is strongly related to the location where they live. But that The location determines what jobs, uh, networks and services are nearby, also influences the availability of transport, particularly public transport options will be location dependent, although, use of public transport will also depend on individuals themselves. Private transport options will more depend on the individual, their resources and their social network. So given the um, combination of location and public and private transport, um, then the access to, tr to transport then provides access to activities, education, jobs, networks and services. Ability to reach those destinations, to do those activities. And that in turn can um, potentially contribute to, that will contribute to then the take up of those opportunities, not that they won't necessarily be taken up, but hopefully will be taken up to a certain extent, and ultimately for people's um, happiness and their, their life fulfillment. So what we sought to do in this study is to seek to get evidence for these, um, these um, relationships. The main data set we used was Understanding Society, where we focused on the English residents, this data set, as Raj um, introduced at the start, covers a broad spectrum of topics, which include um, information about people's um, car access and their travel behaviour, as well as indicators of social participation, ec um, economic circumstances and well-being and health. An important feature of understanding society is the ability to obtain um, local uh, geographic identifiers for, for individuals and their households. And that enabled us to do linking and to, to, to spatial information, including public transport accessibility. So we were able to identify the, the level of public transport access, which um, each individual in the, um, the study um, was offered. We also did use data from ELSA, but I won't be covering that to, today. So car access, um, looking at access to transport, starting with car access, over two thirds of um, adults um, age 16 over living in England have personal car access which we defined as holding a driving license and having access to a car that they can drive whenever they want. On the other side of the coin of course 31% of the population therefore do not have personal car access and are reliant on other forms of mobility including perhaps getting lifts to, uh, to support their lives and if we look at the um, groups in amongst the population that have a lower prevalence of car access, we can see, as illustrated in the um, chart here, uh, young, young adults uh, have a particularly um, low level of car access. Uh, BAME groups ha also have lower access. Those with dis um, economic disadvantage, uh, lower education and income. Um, also those living in larger London and larger cities um, having lower, lower car access. Interesting, we also saw beyond those factors, including this type of location, that the, that the immediate um, bus access um, provision that people have has an influence beyond those other factors, So, which implies that good public transport access uh, reduces the need for personal car access. Turning specifically to that, that bus access now, this is a map of England showing the, um, the distribution of bus access um, across, across the country. Bus access here is uh, measured in terms of um, uh, bus service frequency within a 10 minutes walk and it's shown for um, different local authorities the um, extent of um, uh, pr provision in those local authorities, the, uh, the, the amount of the local areas within those local authorities which have this um, provision of um, frequent bus services. And it's not surprisingly seen that um, 
bus, serv bus access is strongly correlated to population concentration. Beyond um, the objective access to bus services, Understanding Society also asked people to rate their local public transport subjectively. And we found there's a st very strong connection between um, objective measurement of bus access and whether people feel they have good, good bus services. So one fifth of people that, um, uh, one fifth of people across the England are served by a bus more than them um, every five, once more than one every five minutes. And of those, um, three quarters of um, people rate public transport as, as good. So there's a, there's a consistency between objective measurement and, and subjective measurement. So that's access to private and public transport, but looking at use of different transport modes, um, we can see here that cars are used by the majority of people, even more than when we think about, look at personal car access, you've got 87% of people are using cars often, which we define uh, via as understanding society as, um, as every week, um, frequently during the week. Um, we see buses are the next most important transport mode. Um, whilst trains and bicycles are used um, less than the, the other two options, but are more by men than women. So a little bit of context on the use of transport modes, but now I want to focus on um, the impacts of um, access to transport on um, outcomes and looking at both social and economic, one of each, and to, I'll take as an example. Um, so the, Looking at as a social indicator, the question in understanding society is do you go out socially or visit friends when you feel like it? And those people that say they weren't able to do that is illustrated in this chart here. So this is those that wouldn't, couldn't, said they couldn't do that. And we see that then it, people are less likely to say they're able to go out socially um, if they don't have car access, with the higher bars for those without car access. And we also see um, a role of public transport here where with um, poorer public transport, people are more likely to say that they're not able to go out socially. So both um, um, private and public transport um, playing a role here in um, social connections. Particularly, we want to take advantage of the longitudinal data and get more ro very robust evidence. So we carried out longitudinal analysis on this particular question about going out socially and looked at um, this um, by comparing responses across waves. And this is actually across the three year period. So we found those that started off um, not being able to go out socially, but who gained car access in the intervening period were then 1.7 times more likely to say subsequently that they were able to go out socially um, three years later. And the inverse is the case when people lose car access, they are more likely to say that they, they, they became unable to go out socially. So, that, so the role with um, in terms of um, social participation and uh, look, now looking at um, employment, um, par personal car access can be seen to play an important role when it comes to accessing employment. Here we can see um, those in work um, have a much um, higher level of personal car access than those in, in the out of work categories here. This doesn't tell us the causal relationship. It may be that when you get into work, you're then able to afford a car subsequently. So we looked at this longitudinally and we were able to, to see that um, for those who are not in work but had a car at that time, when we looked at them um, two years later, we found that those who had a car to start with were more likely to move into, um, un, in, into employment. So if they'd done employment, they were 2.2 times more likely to move into employment if they had a car to begin with. And also, if they gain car access in that period, they were similarly more likely to, to move in, into employment. So, so, that, so these effects are seen both for those starting out unemployed or in educational training or um, economically inactive. So it looks, uh, shows the importance of, um, of a private car for, for moving into, into employment. We didn't see any um, effects of bus access on employment participation with our individual level data, but perhaps a more um, appropriate analysis on that um, variable has been carried out in some other work looking at census data by Dan Johnson and colleagues in, at Leeds University who showed that longer public transport times from an area um, to, to jobs 
were associated with lower employment levels after accounting for population and car availability. So both private and public transport have, have been found with longitudinal analysis to, to play a role. The main, I want to now um, turn to um, commuting uh, and in the role focusing in, focusing in on employment and looking at, at, at commuting and, and trends in commuting and what we can um, learn from those. This um, chart to begin with shows uh, a decline in commuting trips over time. This is um, commuting trips per person and it's the dark blue um, line at the bottom which is showing that particularly declining trend. So what we've got then um, is commuting has been changing pre-COVID-19 and there's a lot of discussion um, pr prompted about commuting now. I think it's very important to see what the trends were previously. So there has been that decrease in commuting, commuting journeys over about 20 year period. And there's various um, components or explanations have been um, um, uh, found for that. Um, so it's not a case of one single explanation. It's people are commuting on fewer days per week. Commuting is being combined with other journey purposes. More workers do not have a fixed workplace. Working from home is increasing slowly, both those in working from home all the time and occasionally. There are more workers who don't report in a typical week, they don't report working or commuting. And there's um, change in employment um, contracts, more part-time employment and self-employment. At the same time as, as having, we are having, having fewer commuting journeys per person and, 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 our, and at an aggregate level, um, we're seeing commuting distance and dura duration increasing again to a small extent but it's, it's quite steady so for example 26 minutes in 2002 to up to 30 minutes now uh, the current time for the average commute um, journey and in terms of mode share car driving remains a dominant commute mode but there's been a small um, decrease in car driving um, at its mode share from 70 to 67 percent i just want to say a little bit more about some of those yeah, get, get un, underneath those trends a little bit further um, and this is um, showing how public transport has an, becoming increasingly important for those in cities. Um, this shows for three different age groups how the, the, the changes in public transport mode share between 2001 and 2011 from the census data. In the middle we've got the 25 to 34 age group um, and, and you can see a particularly um, su substantial increase in their public transport modal share of 14% um, for those young people in that age group that live in the, the most um, densely populated um, um, areas. So we've, we've also seen that age group in particular increasingly living in those cities. So there is an, an important social trend going there of um, greater public transport use for young, for young workers, particularly in, in more urbanised areas. And young, young, young people in that age group are, are um, having lower licensing levels than they used to in the past in, in some other work that I've carried out has um, looked into that. But it's a, it's a well-known trend that we've got lower licensing rates and lower car access amongst that age group. Valuable insights into this, 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 this tr interesting trend over the last 20 years have also been offered um, in a paper published just the last week by a colleague of mine, Fiona Crawford, who um, segmented um, workers into, or commuters into um, four different groups, four different clusters, according to the frequency of their commuting and the location of their commuting and the timing of their commutes. And this um, shows that um, the regular commute cluster, those who go every, every working day to the same um, workplace location, has been slightly declining over time. And we've got an increase, particularly in the cluster of infrequent um, commuters and those of spatially variable work travel. So we've got less, less regularised commuting occurring over time. Even if workers are making fewer commute journeys than was previously the case, other research that I've done looking at the link between commuting and well-being has shown, and this is using understanding society data, six waves of understanding society data, has shown that 
when people um, experience longer commute journeys, there are negative well-being impacts, and that can be seen particularly here um, for for job satisfaction, leisure time satisfaction, where you can see it a left to right downward profile as the commutes get longer, people's uh, um, outcomes become positive. And for strain, it's going up, which is indicating a greater degree of strain in people's lives when they have longer commute journeys. So but longer commutes a bit end up being tolerated up to a point. They can um, bring higher salaries as indicated in this um, simple bar chart here. Um, but they are less likely to be sustained. Those with longer commutes, 45 minutes at least, uh, are a quarter more likely to change job than other um, commuters. And they're especially likely to, to um, change their, their, their commute, their job in a commute situation if they have, um, if they don't have um, a high salary, don't have a high level of, of job situation. So I hope that on commuting might connect with um, what we've heard earlier about residential mobility, but to just raise some discussion points to finish, um, our research has shown that good transport is pivotal to life opportunities. And that's especially the case for young people who are more likely to, to be um, not actively working and needing to join the, the, the labour force. The availability of um, transport, um, particularly public transport, is not evenly distributed geographically and or, or socially. Both, are, both um, are very important, play a very important role. And my take on this is that residential mobility, as we've heard about earlier, and daily travel, in particular commuting, I think will remain critical in enabling people to access opportunities and for the economic recovery post COVID. Working at home may have become a norm for many of us at the moment, and we wait to see how flexible working arrangements will evolve post COVID-19, but I suspect they will have it, flexible working will be increasingly important to our lives, but it won't um, remove the, the need for physical connection. So I'll finish on that point and, um, Pass back to the um, pass back to you, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed, Kira. A fascinating again, and loads of different uh, issues to to get in uh, under. Maybe you know we're touching them, I'm sure today, but actually loads to discuss um, after uh, the event. The importance of uh, transport. You know, some would have you believe that it's the the only thing that is holding uh, people and places back. Uh, uh, you know, I have some skepticism around that, but. Also, an interest in your, you know, your points about the, the importance of um, the car in all of this. When obviously we have a, a public policy agenda for, you know, which goes well beyond transport, which is focused on, you know, public or mass transit, and particularly often, you know, we talk about rail within that. But actually, as always, if you say buses and buses are important, you will undoubtedly get, you know, get gold stars from me, and you kind of did that, so that's very good. So let's hear a bit of response from uh, from Eleanor. It's always the toughest uh, role to listen to everything. And give some uh, immediate kind of responses, but also just to to chime in with some of our own work in this area, uh, and the degree to which it kind of it, it supports and corroborates what we've heard, or indeed offers some uh, some challenges as well. Eleanor, over to you. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks for the uh, contributions of the speakers. I think there was lots of interesting points uh, to uh, pick on. Um, I suppose what I'm going to do is to try to outline some of our research to build. Uh, on what the speakers have been uh, saying uh, before moving on to trying to wrap up on what the policy implications of what we've heard so far this morning are. Um, in terms of uh, some of our analysis and what it says in this topic, uh, building on what uh, Michael has been talking about, about the reason why uh, people move, uh, we've done some research um, a few years ago um, looking at um, the movement of graduates, uh, where do they go across the country, and the reason behind uh, their movement, as well as uh, uh, we looked at uh, research, for example, of uh, what Michael was mentioning, that is uh, quite unique of the UK, of people, for example, uh, moving away from high income um, urban areas to other parts of the country. And uh, uh, some of the things um, we found um, include that, first of all, uh, 
um, which I think is something uh, that is really important in this discussion. Um, the economic performance of uh, the local area people move into and the vibrancy of uh, that labour market uh, plays an important role in attracting people in or not attracting people in. So, for example, if we think about uh, young graduates, what we see is that they don't move anywhere in the country. They move particularly to cities and in particular uh, cities uh, with vibrant labour market. Our research uh, look at, for example, the correlation between uh, uh, where graduates move and their initial wages. And they found that actually there is a, quite a weak relationship uh, between the two things. And what instead appears to be um, a strong um, uh, driver or there, there appears to be a strong relationship between where graduates move and where they're going seems to be wider labor market opportunities. So not just your initial wage, but the opportunity to find uh, many jobs along the line. So more of a medium to longer term uh, picture. And just to put some numbers on it, for example, we obviously know uh, London um, is particularly appealing to graduates and to people in general as one of the most vibrant labor markets uh, in the UK. And what we see is that if London accounts for 19% of all jobs in the UK, it actually attracts 22% of all those graduates that move and 38% uh, uh, of all those uh, high achievers among the graduates. Uh, so um, young graduates from Russell Group universities um, uh, getting high grades. So um, there are particular um, location decisions there and other cities too uh, tend to have a graduate um, gain um, as part uh, of this process. Uh, but uh, the second point uh, that I want to stress is that even uh, um, people move into cities and at some point they also move out, uh, like my, Michael said, um, there is this trend in the UK. Um, but what I want to stress here is that what we see from our research is that even when people do move out uh, of uh, places like London or other large cities, uh, they tend to actually stay nearby. So they might not be... Um, staying in a, a London city centre or Liverpool city centre, but many of them move uh, within commuting distance of these places or they tend to anyway gravitate towards uh, uh, these areas. And what we see is that uh, they are also different, as Michael said, in terms of the uh, graduates and the reason why graduates move. So what we see is that normally we have this uh, young cohort of people moving into city, and then we get people um, uh, around their 30s that move out of cities. And, uh, um, and this is especially the case in London. And then uh, when we look at where they are, uh, as I just said, they tend to be um, uh, staying in areas uh, uh, within the greater southeast, for example, when it comes to London, within the commuting areas of London, and they tend to maintain a strong link uh, with the city. So once again, I think this really highlights uh, the important role that um, the labor market vibrancy of a place uh, play in determining uh, why people move and where do they move. And uh, over time, this has kind of meant uh, that uh, uh, most cities, in thanks to the job opportunities they provide, have been experiencing population growth. Uh, and that this has been particularly the case for our stronger economies. So if we think about places um, 40 years ago and we think about them today, what we see is that those have grown more, tend to be stronger economies. Um, places like Reading, London, Exeter and Cambridge uh, grew a lot over the past 40 years, whereas it's not so much the case uh, for other places that tend to have weaker economy, like for example, uh, Middlesbrough or Hull and Birkenhead. So, and, and that this is me now moving on to uh, policy uh, conclusions or policy implications of all of this. And uh, uh, one of the things that brings a uh, spark to mind from the conversation so far is that we talked a lot about the benefits of moving that people uh, gain, uh, uh, but it's important to remember that not all people move, and the question for policy is what to do with the people that actually don't move. So we know that around 40% of all workers 
only ever worked um, in the area in which they grew up, in, in which they lived. And we know that this is much higher uh, for uh, people uh, with low or no qualifications. So um, I suppose when it comes to policy, especially the leveling up agenda, we know that um, migration can uh, provide better outcomes uh, for people, but we know that that won't be a solution uh, for everybody. And going back to Ian's point about whether we should invest in people or invest in places, Clearly, investment is in people is good because it gives them the opportunity to choose what's best for them in terms of employment opportunity within an area or exploring opportunities in other parts of the country. But investment in places will be very important too, especially uh, because most people don't move and we need to do something to support and provide opportunities to these people as well. So when it comes to, okay, so what can we do from policy? As Kiran mentioned, transport can play an important role, but keeping in mind the very local nature of uh, um, the travel to work areas or the areas over which people move and live their lives, we need to concentrate uh, this investment in transport, if we think it's important, uh, in very specific local areas and within cities, for example, with uh, investment uh, in the bus services, as has been uh, stressed. Um, it will also be important to uh, in, increase investments in skills and also increase investment in innovation and technology in general to ensure that uh, places that haven't seen or experienced the same growth, places that are less attractive to people to as destinations for internal migration, for example, can actually grow in the future and uh, um, continue to attract, uh, become to attract, they start to attract uh, uh, new people. And uh, uh, last point uh, from uh, me, um, we touched a bit about uh, working from home and technology. And yes, uh, this might have, might as well have a role in uh, determining uh, whether uh, people, for example, in high skilled professional jobs uh, will decide to move or not in the future. Uh, but when we think about, once again, about the people that are not moving, uh, the people that are uh, stuck in one place, a lot of these uh, are in lower skill roles that might not necessarily, even if they have the opportunity of technology, actually be able to use this technology for their day-to-day -day work. And therefore, this might not be um, a game changer for, for them. So something to think about for policy. Great, thank you very much indeed, um, Eleanor. So let, let's just move to, to some of the, the questions and ref, reflections. Raj, just to let you know, uh, I'll, I'll get, bring you in at the end rather than now, but there's been quite, we, we've, we've definitely done what we wanted to do was to drive a lot of interest in understanding society and basically lots of questions about that's fantastic data, how do I get access to it? How do I know more about it? So I'll leave you to have the final word as we get towards um, 11.30 um, on, on that. Um, but just to start off, um, and maybe come to you first, um, Ian, and then others to, uh, to to come on the back of it. Just this question about: Do we have any sense as to the the pent up demand? I suppose for you know for moving uh, in a sense. You talked about the, you know what's going on in terms of those are actually moving. The observable we can see. Do we have any insights as to the, you know what that what that potential numbers could be and what's holding them back, Ian, uh, and then maybe Michael? Well. I've considered this, and it's a question we asked when we're doing the decreasing migration research. The problem is, is there's actually um, little evidence that goes back far enough to see whether people intend to, in, you know, whether people still want to move at the same rate as they did in the 70s as they do now, or vice versa. So that's one of the questions. Um, I've actually looked at understanding society. And there's a relationship between whether people desire to move or not, according to whether they feel trusted in their neighbourhood, whether they feel it's a good neighbourhood and so on. And those things seem to sort of work OK and they look right in terms of the coefficients. So I suspect that possibly there's no evidence positively for frustrated stayers. I suspect that maybe people um, actually um, are happy to stay put in some cases. And that's just my hunch. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's a good hunch. That's what we're here. Yeah, we're, 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 we're keen to get your hunches as well as your your fully considered and well researched ideas. Michael, what's your um, what's your view on the on this sort of the pent up demand and and um, and frustration? Uh, I've 
I've personally not uh, looked into it, but the Rory Coulter, who's at UCL, has used um, British Household Panel Survey data to look at um, intentions and then realised behaviours afterwards. But so this is more from the intention to move, um, and then whether they achieve that intention or, or, or they don't, which is interesting analysis. But I can't remember the shares of of, of how many. But I'm sure, I know it wasn't a sort of a non-significant group of people. It was, um, but yeah, I mean, that sort of work can be done, hopefully, with more and more waves of understanding society. Then we can start to get a handle on that. And hopefully, joining in the geographical coordinates and being able to add some contextual characteristics as well, and we can start to explore whether the people are stuck in place through choice or constraint. Um, yeah, and in your work on, um, on motivation uh, issues, Michael, do you have a sense as to, you know, have you looked at the, I suppose, the push and pull, uh, you know, factors in people feeling they have to move for whatever reason rather than they, they want to move? This is a live conversation uh, in our space, you know, in a sense that people decry movement on the one hand because they see people moving out of their, you know, of their place. You hear this from uh, politicians often because obviously they're place-based um, constituencies. You know, they say people have to move out of our place because there aren't opportunities we need to bring the opportunities here and they would simply stay. I mean, do you have any insight on, on that, on that question or that issue? Um, I, I think that there are data limitations because a, a lot of the way these questions are asked are, are after the move and they ask, why did you move? There are actually only two surveys that I know of in the world that, that ask the question of why people stay uh, in place. So there's one in New Zealand uh, that's linked to their labor for survey from a decade ago or so, but that doesn't have a variable like housing tenure, which makes exploring why people stay very difficult. There's another one in Norway, but that's fixed specifically to the Oslo region, which could be interesting given the labor market uh, things, but it would, that's one of my questions for Raj as, as well, potentially if it, it would be possible to have questions instead of looking at the migration process, looking at the immobility or the process and looking at why people stay in place whether they like staying in place something as detailed as they have on the on the reason for moving yeah okay and just staying with staying with you and then i'll bring in um kieran and, and ian as well we, we talked a little bit about have you looked at how motivations change whether it's the first move or the second move or the third move and you know the kind of factors have you got insight into any of that you know just for example does family become more in movement on the, on the second move rather than necessarily the first move? That would be my um, uneducated hunch. But yeah, you know. uh, I've not looked at individual sort of uh, life course movements and then, and, and then they're changing intentions. The analysis that I did is, is sort of breaking up across, you know, fixed life cycle stages, which isn't ideal. But uh, to do that, we, yeah, it'd be nice to link up the data uh, and, and, and track people through individuals through time but I've, I've not done that now but it, I mean it should be possible with understanding society I think I think the question is asked every two years or something All right. okay uh, uh, Ian do you want to come in and just uh, on that or uh, on, the, on the previous as well just your thoughts on that yeah actually just thinking about sort of the intention to move I've actually been playing about with understanding society data and of course there's a positive relationship between intending to move and moving over the next few years but it's also interesting to note that people who intend to move tend to move further than those who say they didn't intend to move and actually ended up moving anyway. So it suggests that people who maybe didn't want to move, perhaps, and had to move for false reasons, they tend to be more local movers. So there's something interesting there, perhaps moving from a weaker position and people not wanting to go, tending to go shorter distances. Yeah, no, that's a very go, go further. Yeah, that's a very good point. And Kieran, just come in on the back of that, because in a sense, what was fascinating, I mean, lots of fascinating things, you know, but the, the length of commute and then how that affects different aspects of life satisfaction, uh, strain, uh, leisure, clearly a trade off between longer commute and, you know, the, the recognition that leisure time is squeezed, but it's less clear on longer commutes and overall life satisfaction. Is that is that right? But just your thoughts on, on that on that point and uh, Ian's point there, Kieran. Yeah, no, I'm pleased you spotted, spotted that. Yeah, the relationship um, is, is not so strong with overall life satisfaction um, because people are getting compensated 
for the for the negative side of um, longer commutes on, um, so for example, strain or uh, less leisure time by 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 having high, higher salaries uh, or better, better jobs that they prefer. So you're you're not seeing a gradient overall so much on that. And that would um, suggest that people are making that choice, right? And in a sense, that's a a choice they feel they're in control of, rather than uh, a choice that's been forced upon them. Is that right? Yeah. Well, well, that's, yeah, that, that's exactly how you know, we how it interpreted. We were also interested in in how that might be sustained if people are in that position initially. Uh, they might really welcome the making them happy to make that trade off. But if they are stuck in that situation for a long period of time, we saw signs that then they they, they it is, it, the compensation disappears. They are starting to feel feel that and not uh, the life life satisfaction of those that are sustained long commutes over a long period of time were were lower um, to sm to a small extent. Yeah, no, very good. Um, uh, Jeff Austin, Jeff, you had a you had, well, you put two questions in, Jeff. Uh, I want you to focus on your your first question, and I suppose particularly the last aspect of it, because I think it touches on an, on several other questions we've had. So, Jeff, if you're if you're still on the call, can you just unmute, ask your question? It's your first one um, that I'm particularly um, interested in, and I'll get our panel to respond, Jeff. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, many years ago, working in in London, um, and being interested in uh, the, the plight of those trying to enter the labour market and those who've left the labour market and having difficulty getting back into it, uh, we had to look at the fact that uh, even if we paid people's taxi fares, uh, they wouldn't go for a job interview a short distance across London. They were sort of trapped in their own areas. And that promote, you know, prompted us to chat to Ian Gordon, who's the London labour market expert then and still is. And, and he gave me some fascinating raw data, as it were, from his studies. And that's that about 80% of people get their jobs by word of mouth. And that's from people in employment, even in, you know, what we might see as high rated jobs. And 10% of people get their job from the evening standard, which requires the ability to read. And... Um, uh, about 10% or less, 5% got it through the job centre. So that, 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 that has a big impact on monolithic social housing estates. And um, that issue is still with us today. So this lack of networks is quite important. So what, it, what interested me is how the migration studies can, as it were, do a little study to retrofit into all the difficult uh, areas of high unemployment, difficult circumstances, English as a second language, all those sorts of issues. Yep. How can you get into that and find a way for us to help these people get into work? Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. And this touches on different aspects of all of what you've talked about. You know, in a sense, you, you know, you've been uh, brilliant in trying to talk about the trade-offs associated with you know, mobility, and you tackle that in different ways. I mean, you know, so I think Jeff's point is, in a sense, is a, is a very, very good one. And it, it touches on a broader point, which is, you know, should mobility be actively encouraged by, let's say, the government as a policy, because there are social and economic goods associated with it that outweigh, obviously, the, the negatives. That's a tough question. I appreciate I'm talking to a bunch of uh, academics, you know, and when all the rest, but nevertheless, uh, that's that's you know I'm allowed to do this as the chair. You can you can ignore my question nevertheless. But Ian, let's start with you. It's a tough question, but you know, the virtues of mobility uh, should they be actively encouraged? Do they outweigh the costs? Well, this is actually a relatively old debate, and it's something where there's actually been a lot of work done on this in Northern Ireland. And in fact, in Northern Ireland, we had a policy in the 80s and 90s called targeting social need which was basically based on bringing jobs to local areas which were suffering disadvantage. Now, the problems with those were that the locals didn't necessarily get the jobs. The jobs often went for outsiders who commuted in. I think in general policy terms, it's probably better to try to make people more mobile because a lot of investment isn't necessarily something which can be located in communities. I mean, if it's market-oriented, if it's consumer based, if it's service sector based, you can't necessarily locate it in a deprived area or at a worker's supply like that. So in terms of increasing resilience and not concentrating on just one employer, I mean, you can locate manufacturers perhaps in certain areas, 
but trying to locate other things and actually sort of diversifying mobility is probably the best way. I also reflected when I heard Jeff's question too on some work that I did many years ago now, about 15 years ago with Anne Green, where we were looking at the uh, labour market perceptions of people in Belfast. And um, I mean, in Belfast, there's obviously sectarianism, which is um, dividing the city and which is an extra barrier in terms of where people will go and not go. But the interesting thing is, I think that um, earlier work in the West Midlands and other places would indicate, and actually in Belfast, well, it wasn't just sectarianism. People had relatively restricted perceptual maps of the city. Yes. So quite highly localised. Things like rivers, things like major highways, things like that tended to define people's sort of immediate neighbourhood. So in Belfast, probably more so for the dimension of sectarianism, but I don't think by any means unusual as well. But that was qualitative work we did, where we actually got people to draw maps of places they knew and where they would go and not go and stuff like that. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, Michael, uh, just, you know, your, your thoughts on, you know, just reflection in relation to the labour market, but then this broader point about, you know, the the position that mobility should have as a within the policy framework and should it be more actively encouraged than it than maybe it currently um it currently is what's your what are your thoughts on that um i just think it's so difficult because migration is such a selective process so if you want to encourage migration how do you really do that that it's it's just that it's sustainable lifelong um you might encourage people i think in the us they've done voucher uh, things on small experimental uh, levels in different communities for getting people out of uh, certain contexts but we know that migrate people who tend to migrate and and sort of win from the migration process are those who've, who've who have achieved the human capital levels that allow them to invest that human capital at their destination uh, how you can build a policy other than promoting social mobility through schooling and, and uh, better access to university for deprived communities. Uh, I think that seems, I think migration in itself is a sort of a mechanism rather than a, uh, something that we can promote. Yeah, it's good, it's a good, yeah, I mean, obviously there are, you know, you've all touched on there are questions and issues in relation, for example, to the, to the housing market, both in terms of the cost of housing in some localities and the very large differentials which actively you know reduces the ability to move there's the ability for example to move or not you know within say the social housing or the council housing sort of system which makes it you know at the margins much more difficult for you know for those kind of tenants to shift around uh, compared to say homeowners or indeed uh, to those in the private rented market but I, I you know I accept that it's a, a incredibly complicated I was just kind of interested in, in your view on that but uh, Kieran move to to you what's your view on this and you know your thoughts on you know whether we should be encouraging more of this and it's the same sort of issue where increasingly i think commuting is seen as a bad right be, that is a bad thing uh we should be reducing the amount of commuting i hear this a lot all the time you know it's just a bad thing actually part of the the the, the appetite and enthusiasm for working from home underlying that is that actually traveling around and commuting is a bad thing we need to to reduce it, even if it's done by public transport. So it's not even a, a car issue. We don't even get to that point. But your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, that there is that perspective. But I think the other, the, yeah, there's an important perspective of, of those who are deprived areas and where there's low levels of um, em, employment participation. Um, I think lo local mobility um, is, is, is very important. And um, yeah, I think it shouldn't get mixed up with what you were saying uh, earlier about um, you know travel commuting is a, is bad. I think I think to have um, less polluting but um, good lo local transport options is is hugely important for 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 the functioning of, a, of t t um, towns and cities and for people's opportunities. And I think options that are just being discussed pre COVID nineteen were there's good discussion emerging around free public transport, which is being um, provided various places in, in Europe. Luxembourg, is, I think, is now introducing it. Um, some various French towns, uh, struggling French towns have introduced it. I think it's been quite promising. Uh, um, that's not a very targeted approach, that's, it's, but, it, but it's to, to, to relatively underperforming uh, places. A, a more targeted approach would be mobility credits, 
to, to those out of work and I think I think there are a lot more is done for particularly for younger people who, who are out of work um, you, um, in, in training um, early on in their career in, in other countries I visit when I visit other countries in Europe you just see signs of um, schemes for for using the rail free free passes for the rail system and so on regional rail networks I, I think particularly around local r regional transport targeted support and especially now with COVID-19 and and yesterday's and and other recent um, announcements of you know strict measures now we need we need to be thinking of quite cre new creative options uh, to support the uh, to support the economy yeah there's a role for thinking about free public transport local public transport and mobility targeted mobility credits yeah no I, I completely agree with that let me finish with or at least I kind of conclude this bit before I get Raj a chance to just say a little bit more about that uh, as I said, I mean, that probably means on in your sort of sphere, um, thinking much more about things like buses, uh, where they run, who runs them and who controls them, uh, which, as we know, outside of London, uh, they are not controlled or influenced heavily by uh, by public authorities because of the deregulated nature of the you know, the market. And they do really matter for some of the issues, that, you know, particularly at the smaller scale of mobility. Um, so, you know, it's things like that I think we should be focused on as much as a very big i think we're in a huge moment of change as regards that with potentially first buses withdrawing um from the market we were hearing yesterday exactly exactly right um raj we have a couple of minutes left um over to you to 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 tell everybody where they can get this treasure trove of uh of uh, of data or at least more insight and indeed anything else from uh, from ian and from michael and from uh, kieran that you picked up that you just wanted to to respond to so uh, raj over to your final thoughts um Thank you, Andrew. Um, yes, um, a couple of points from me. Uh, certainly, um, just to say that um, there have been papers done on job search methods and regional mobility. So I think when we try and wrap up all these uh, presentations and put a package of information together, we'll try and feed back a, a lot more information than we've been able to cover today uh, in a time-limited um, event, of course. Um, so hopefully people will find that useful. Um, in terms of getting hold of the data itself, uh, it's pretty straightforward. We collect the data, um, but it's distributed by the UK data service um, where any individual can register as a user and download uh, the Understanding Society data sets. Uh, there's a lot of useful guidance on our website about how to get started, how to access the data. Um, <clears throat> Um, uh, and um, to assess what variables or content it, it contains um, in, in particular terms of questions you might be interested in. Um, worth noting that there are different levels of access. So the end user license, which gives you access very easily, um, only contains urban, rural splits and regional splits. So it, it tells you where the sample member, which region they live in, or whether they live in urban or rural locations. If you want more granular or specific geocodes, then you need to apply for a special license. Uh, that's again, a pretty straightforward process, but what the special license will do is give you access to the geocodes, which you can then link to individual sample members and undertake analysis uh, that way. And that kind of gives you everything from a low super output area link to a local authority area link, for instance, to some other geography that you might wish to create, you know, for example, seaside towns um, as, a, as a specific group of places um, or um, political constituencies or whatever one wants to kind of link back to. So hopefully that will be useful. And over time, we're trying to link our data to other sources of data, Will. So we'll try and make those available at the moment we're beginning to collect more granular information on car details you know whether people who are changing cars for instance are switching to more fuel efficient cars or electric cars or not that's kind of information and we'll try and put that up when we can uh, so you should be able to do more interesting stuff on transport as well uh, hopefully that's useful but certainly uh, I'll put my details or at least details of where you can get more help and support when we uh, put the information up and people can get that information through our user support teams. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, um, Raj. As, as, as Raj said, we'll put up all the slides, as I said earlier on as well, we'll put up all the slides and all the links and all the materials um, that you can, um, that you build access via the, uh, the, the, the website and uh, in contact details for Raj and brothers. So it's a follow up on, on anything that we've, um, we've discussed today. So it's, it's just 11.30. So we, uh, we need to um, finish. Uh, my thanks to the Standing Society and indeed to, to Raj for partnering in with us on the event. Obviously, huge thanks to our speakers, Ian, Michael, Kieran and, uh, and Eleanor for their brilliant uh, contributions. I think each, each one of those contributions uh, could have had a, a, a session all on its own. So maybe there's something for us to come back to uh, in the future. Uh, thank you all indeed for, for joining um, and for your, your questions. I hope you found it uh, insightful and uh, useful. Um, uh, our next event, the next city, Centre for Cities event is next Thursday, uh, the 16th of July at 11 o'clock. Uh, and that one we're going to be focusing on uh, the role of cities in achieving net zero and reducing uh, fuel poverty. Um, so hope to see uh, some of you uh, back here on next uh, Thursday. Uh, but for now, as always, stay safe and go well. Thank you very much indeed.